what we continue today, rooting out sin in our lives. We name it. We name it so that we confess it. We can repent of it. We can actually turn and see a Jesus who forgives it. And so today, we read of sin as falling short. Uh, Sin is falling short. You have missed the mark. You didn't meet the standard. You are insufficient. You fall short. You are not good enough. Uh, Many of my friends are now having children, and as I talk with them, they share this desire. They want their child to be a good person. And I cannot fault anybody for wanting such a thing for their child, but I, I do wonder if there isn't a nagging question underneath that desire to be a good person. How good? Are they going to be good enough? No, in the desire to be good, there is a nagging question underneath it that I think we already know in our hearts. Am I good enough? If I've fallen short, if I haven't met the standard, am I good enough? It's for the student. The student feels it intensely, sometimes around exam time, but really all year. I'm around med students down at Reliant at Crave Coffee House, and every week it seems that there's an ultimatum on if they get to stay in the program. Every week, another exam that tests them and asks them, are you good enough to be here? Do you belong? I have a a friend who's in her early 30s, and she is dating, and she is experiencing a lot of disappointment. She jokes that she's meeting too many guys with rocks for brains. And uh, what's happening is that as she's disappointed by trying to find someone to share her life with, she's now at a point where she wonders, am I good enough? Uh, You get married. It's your first year of marriage. You have your first apartment, and it's way smaller than the house you live in now, right? And as you're trying to figure out how to share life with one another and share space, uh, you have these expectations of one another, and then there's like these fights that come about it, and you can't quite make sense of why it's happening. But at some point in trying to figure out how to share a life together, you wonder, am I good enough for you for all of this? Well, you're a new parent, and uh, you're laying in bed. The child's already cried three times. And so you lay in bed and you hear the child cry a fourth and you stay super still expecting the other person to wake up and deal with the problem. But finally you realize they're not moving and you're the father so it's your job. So you stir awake and as you walk up the steps to go to the child, you wonder, am I good enough? Good enough to be a father? Uh, You're an employee, your boss has expectations, demands, but never a raise, I know. And then you wonder, am I good enough? You're a caretaker for a loved one. You've loved them all your life, you've given them everything. But at the end of life, marriage has changed. You care for their medical needs, you drop them off at a doctor's appointment, You go back into your car, you have your head in your hands, and you wonder, am I doing enough? Am I good enough? No, it's it's not enough to be good. You have to be good enough. It's an exhausting question that you were never meant to have to ask, and yet here we are. At the beginning of creation, God said everything was good, and he looked at humans, and he said, you are very good. But when we went our own way, when we fell short of God's expectation, all of a sudden there was good, not so good, bad, and even evil all around us. And we're left with that difficult question, am I good enough? So how are you going to cope? How are you going to get from day to day? How are you going to get through the day when you just are not good enough? Well, I, like any other millennial, spend too much time on my phone. I flick through the timelines. I have plenty of content to consume. At 9 a.m., I get my screen time report. I haven't seen it yet, but it's going to condemn me. I'm not good enough. 
But as I flip through, uh, the algorithm has found out, I didn't tell it, but it found out I'm a pastor somehow. And I just get Bible verse after Bible verse. And I'm not saying Bible verses are boring, but it's not as exciting as what it could be. As I'm flicking through my timeline, I'm getting Bible verse after Bible verse, and then I get from my millennial therapist with a green background just three words, you are enough. You are enough. I said, that sounds nice. Was that a Bible verse? Did Jesus say that? I really wish he did. But no, as, as I look at it, I realize that maybe you are enough works. I tried to think of plausible scenarios. Maybe it works for the person who goes through a breakup and is like, I don't need them, right? You are enough. You don't need someone to complete you. And maybe that's true. I don't know where else it works, but there is no amount of manifesting. There is no amount of mantra speaking into the mirror. You are enough that can convince me that I actually am. Because I, like you, am pulled apart at the seams. It's wearing thin. And I wonder, deep down, am I good enough? How are we going to respond to that question? How will we cope? I was driving on 44 on my way to work, and there was a truck in front of me. It was a lifted truck, really big. And on the back of the tailgate, it said, level up, put it into a higher gear. And I said, dope. Why didn't I try that? Why didn't I just try harder? Maybe then I would be enough, and it would all work out. No, there's no amount of mantras, there's no amount of sayings, there, there's really no amount of words that can tell us we are enough. You need a person in the flesh. He speaks and it matters because he died, he rose again, and his words matter for you. So when will things be good? When will they be good again? If things are bad, when will it be enough? Well, Jesus, on his way to the cross, takes a moment, and he talks to some religious leaders. He talks to some disciples, and in the week leading up to his death, he talks about something funny that you might not expect. He talks about the last day, judgment day. It almost makes you a little bit uncomfortable until I, I discovered that actually um, our confirmation students here, our middle schoolers, they had to choose a topic upon which to write a theological essay, and a number of them wanted to do Judgment Day. Yeah, what's going on with that? Well, this day is a day where we look to Jesus and we hear that things will be good again, but maybe not in the way you expected. See, because Judgment Day is actually a really important part of our faith in that um, we are not a cult who tries to guess the timing. We're not a cult who names the day when it's going to happen. No, no, no. We don't take that power. We don't try to control people. And we also don't try to escape this world. We aren't pretending that there's nothing for us here. No, we actually have purpose to love and care for one another here. But no, this end, this last day, this Judgment Day gives us great hope. Because we are nagged by the question, am I good enough? Well, here's how it starts. Jesus shares these words with us, and this is how the last day will go. Read these words with me. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, and he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. All right, imagine this scene because this is going to happen and this is exciting for us. So the Son of Man, that's Jesus Christ, sits on the throne and he is king. He was king at the right hand of the Father, but now he's king on the last day. And it's him who's actually going to bring down the verdict. And the verdict is this. There's some who are on the right and some who are on the left. And it seems odd to me because this is like not how a courtroom works. Uh, there's no time for the people who are being judged to submit evidence. There's no time for character witnesses to come in and try to explain if they should be on the right or the left. 
No, see, for some reason, and maybe it was because I misbehaved and I had a grandmother who tried to get me to shape up, I thought that maybe on the last day there would be like a big video board in a stadium where I would have to watch all of my failures alongside God and he'd go, can you explain that one? But no, here what we see is that the trial is over. The verdict has come down. No evidence, no character witness, no performance needed on your behalf. The verdict has happened because the trial is over. Your sin put on trial in Jesus. Jesus put on trial, hung on a cross, died, buried. Your sin was judged on that day, not on the last day. And so those who trust in Jesus now are off to the right, and those who do not trust in Jesus are off to the left. He actually uh, then speaks to the people who are on the right. He says, uh, you know, I have wanted you for myself all along. Blessed are you. Come into the inheritance that my Father has for you. And here is how he explains it. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous are going to answer, when did we do any of that at all? No, see, because I wasn't trying to keep track of what I was doing or, or any perceived good. Um, I, I just don't recall when this happened. See, because on the last day, it's, it's not about you proving yourself good enough. This is actually Jesus giving you everything he has done. He is going to make your wrongs right. He is going to give you his righteousness. That's how it goes on the last day. No need to prove yourself good enough. Jesus has already done it. It's kind of like imagine that you're sitting across from a hiring manager at a job interview. And he goes, all right, so let's uh, think about it. Let's look at a resume and see if you kind of stack up for this senior analyst position. And as he's looking at the resume, you, he, his face is kind of confused. And so he puts that resume down. He reaches into a desk drawer, grabs another resume out, and he goes, oh, by God, you are overqualified for this job. Because what he's looking at is not your resume, not your accomplishments. He's looking at Jesus's. You are in Jesus, and everything Jesus has done is yours. It's not about being good enough. It's about a Jesus who is good to you. Well, he still has more to say because he has to deal with those on the left. And he says... For you on the left, and he says this with sadness in his heart, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for anyone but the devil and his angels. God's heart breaks when people try to prove themselves to be good enough. God's heart breaks when, when people try to think of themselves as good and, and then end up using other people so that you can prove yourself that you are good. God does not need you to be good enough. God needs you to trust in the one who has done good to you. See, because he actually describes it this way, for I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And they go, hold up a second. Jesus, I'm sure I've done something good. I'm sure there's something I've done here that we can put into the record that will say I'm good enough. But that's not how it works with Jesus. These are the ones who just decided they would try to be good enough, get on the treadmill of life to prove themselves. And Jesus sends them away, and they get exactly what they want. They get to be away from Jesus. The good news of the last day is that the verdict comes down apart from any of your performance. 
the verdict comes down in your favor apart from anything you've done. Any good, any bad, any failures, any desire to be good, it's all excluded because on the last day the verdict comes down and it is about what Jesus has done for you. See, in this desire to actually be good or even good enough, every day you are putting yourself into a courtroom. Every day you put yourself on trial of will I be good enough today? And will I be good enough so that on the last day God actually confirms that I am in fact good? But no, in Jesus, you have everything you need. Jesus has been good to you. His life for yours. And you end up right, not wrong. Am I good enough? It strikes me that um, this question weighs heavy upon young people because if I'm honest, I think we put unnecessary burden on middle schoolers and high schoolers. I think we actually are asking this question, are you good enough, without actually asking it, and we need to start to rethink a little bit. I was talking with a high schooler, and um, rightly so, he had no answer for me, and I said that what I now learn might be just kind of a dumb question. I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? Why would that be a goofy question? Well, what do you want to be? Choose who you are. Because what you choose to be, that's it. That's your identity. And if you choose wrong, then you're not good enough. What do you want to be? Or uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, We're waiting on you. Start producing Start doing something, make yourself lovable, go get married, start the family, then you can finally be in. Then God will finally be happy with you. But you are not a self-improvement project. You are not something God is trying to make into something new so that then you are lovable. God simply loves you right where you are. You have no need to prove yourself good enough. Because your God has been good to you. And he's been good in the most improbable way. Uh, This Lent is starting to get a little bit too Lenty, a little bit too dark for me. I'm ready for another day, a new day. But before I get to that Easter resurrection day, we're going to have to go through a day that we call good, good Friday. And make no mistake about it, it is a good day for you, but there is a lot of bad that's going to happen. A lot of bad is going to happen on that day that Jesus will suffer, he will die, he will be buried in a tomb. Make no mistake, Good Friday requires a lot of bad to happen. Yet it's that Good Friday where much bad happens that good is done for you. It's actually in this act of all this evil and bad being placed on Jesus that he says, Father, forgive them. And then at the end of it, when he goes to die, he doesn't say, good enough. He says, it is finished. No more striving. Those who are in Jesus Christ are rescued, saved from their sin. He trades his life for yours. That's the day we look forward to. So this week, when life is exhausting and you're pulled apart at the seams, you wonder, am I good enough? Look to a Jesus who undoubtedly is good to you. Amen.